Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are joining us remotely, this is Senate Education. It is Wednesday, uh, February 20th, uh, I'm sorry, February 10th. We are going to start uh, the day with uh, Carolyn Weir. Ms. Weir, thanks for joining us. Uh, Ms. Weir is from the um, McClure Foundation. And as many of you will recall, the McClure Foundation gave uh, Vermonters a very generous gift last year, which uh, hopefully she'll take the time just to, to bring us back to that moment, why they did what they did, as well as some of the outcomes that they witnessed from having done that. This is, I would say, uh, a continuation of the conversation that we have all had around what might we be doing in the future for uh, Vermont students and with regard to giving them greater access to higher education. Uh, along those lines, I just wanna let uh, senators know that uh, Senator Hooker, the vice chair and I had some time this afternoon with the money chairs in both the House and the Senate talking a little bit. Uh, they were very interested and Senator Hooker, please uh, add to this or, or, or correct this if I'm getting any of it wrong. I think they were uh, very pleased to see uh, our general um, take uh, from yesterday's testimony. Um, they are uh, going to be partnering with us going forward again on how best to uh, allocate, direct, recommend funds going in certain directions from the $128 million that education is getting in CARES funds, some of which um, it's some of which we can be directed, some of which cannot be directed, but Senator Kitchell is interested in us at the very least making certain that the agency of education, our schools, mental health professionals, Vermonters in general know where we believe uh, fin uh, financial support is going to be needed. So we will continue those conversations. Uh, I've asked Secretary French to come in on Monday uh, for in, that'll give us an opportunity to share with him some of our thinking that came out of yesterday's discussion and also hear from the Agency of Education. What we did not have an opportunity to talk to Senator Kitchell and others about, which hopefully will uh, I'll have time either later today or tomorrow. And that brings us back to really what we're talking about right now. And that is what can we do uh, with some of these CARES, do CARES dollars or general fund dollars uh, or education dollars, but likely general fund or CARES, federal funds, to again, give our students greater access to higher education. Uh, Senator Hooker, am I missing anything? Did you wanna add anything? Uh, no, just that uh, it was clear that, you know, we only have control over a certain amount of the money. Uh, much of the, the funds would go to the schools and uh, we were hoping that we could have some direction as to how that would be spent, but we can't really tell them what to do with it. Right. And to quote Senator Kitchell, she's hoping to use the bully pulpit in some ways, uh, get this out there that these are the needs that uh, policy committees have identified um, and, uh, and, and sort of force some of those conversations. So with that, uh, Ms. Weir, thank you again for taking the time to be with us and for your outreach and uh, everything that you and the McClure Foundation have done for Vermonters. I thought uh, a great way to start would be for you to just tell us a little bit about yourself as well as um, the history behind the grant, what you did, what, why you did it, um, and uh, we'll have a conversation. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee for welcoming me to testify about what we've learned from our graduation gift to the Vermont High School class of 2020. For the record, my name's Carolyn Weir. I'm here on behalf of the McClure Foundation, where I serve as executive director. Um, as it's helpful, I invite you to refer to the three-page fact sheet on the initiative that I've submitted for today's testimony, um, which I can also drop in the chat if helpful. I have about six, seven minutes of testimony to share, and of course, welcome questions um, during or, or after. We are a 25-year affiliate of the Vermont Community Foundation. We've spent the past decade or so exclusively focused on workforce development and supporting college and career training systems in ways that promote equity and resilience. So when the scope of the pandemic became clear last spring, including signs of mass deferments and post-secondary continuation among those seniors approaching high school graduation, we asked ourselves a question. 
in this time of uncertainty, what could we do to offer graduating seniors an easy option for continuing their education and then behind the scenes support a relational handoff from high school-based counselors to college-based academic and career advisors who could help chart next steps. So keeping to our design values of hope and simplicity, in terms of both messaging and access, we landed on a graduation gift to the entire Vermont high school class of 2020 of one free course of their choosing at CCV last fall. So our gift covered tuition and all fees associated with any course a student chose to take, including courses that are part of shorter term certificate programs. And given all of the uncertainties that were in play last year and quite frankly continue to be in play this year, we weren't sure how many students would take us up on the offer. Um, it was just an idea and we were trying to do the right thing by young people. By September, over 600 students had enrolled in their free course, representing over 10% of graduates statewide and double the typical enrollment of this cohort at CCB. This at a time when first year enrollment at community colleges was down about 20% nationally. And for me, this, this is the headline. Enrollment doubled when new enrollment nationally at community colleges plummeted. Now, can we credit all of that to the grad gift? I imagine not, but it's clearly, um, it's clearly part of the story. And as you know, Vermont has long been an outlier nationally in terms of the percentage of the general fund allocated to public higher education and in terms of the tuition cost of public colleges generally and the community college in particular. And those are conditions we believe have impacted Vermont's demographics, the credentialing of Vermont's workforce. So to see Vermont profiled nationally as a bright spot in terms of community college enrollment last fall was really something. To us, the scale of enrollment in this initiative demonstrates that when the public's perception of cost barriers are removed, Vermonters enroll. Also, the perception of ease of access matters a lot, especially at a time like this. So early demographics data confirmed that the gift benefited students from all backgrounds. About half say they would be first in family with a degree. Um, interestingly enough, Orleans County had the highest enrollment rate relative to its young adult population. Um, and we have just heard in so many ways from students and parents that the gift relieved financial stress, helped clarify career interests and um, abilities, including college going abilities, and encouraged or convinced these young adults to continue their education amid so much disruption. So um, a student named Nick said college was something he dreamed about but never thought he'd be able to afford. He's from a low income household, quote, every dollar counts. He took two CCV courses um, last oh. fall, in including intro to visual communications. And he said college felt manageable because half of his courses were paid for. He was working at the time as a, a full-time personal care attendant while taking the courses and his dream is to become a graphic designer. So just recently, we um, had access to new course success data, uh, student survey data. Um, and so we now know that of the 1,200 or so CCV courses in which these students enrolled last fall, 90% were completed, about 70% were completed successfully. And what matters the most to us is that 80% of surveyed students interacted with their CCB advisor during the fall semester. Um, the large majority of those meetings involve discussion or development of plans for next steps in education or career development. And 81% of surveyed students indicate they plan to continue their education. As I read that, I think that means you know, in the next year. So looking back, we point to three factors in the early success of this initiative um, or this idea. Number one, the core design values were hope and simplicity. Every single component of this initiative was designed to inspire hope and to be really easy to access and to understand. The scholarships were first dollar in, um, they were only available at CCB. Students could choose any course available at CCV. Every single person who graduated high school um, in Vermont in 2020 was eligible. 
And we believe that structuring the gift is an easily understood and universal opportunity for students of color to take up across the board. Our messaging was very simple. It was positive. We told young people we believed in them and we thought they deserved something they could count on in this time of uncertainty. Number two, um, in terms of the, the factors that we think contributed to the take up at the scale that we saw was that we partnered with an institution that embraced a really big idea on a really short timeline and was positioned to quickly scale its courses and its supports. CCV was um, just ready to serve. They're a Vermont's access institution, right? They enroll the greatest number of Vermonters of any college in the state. Becoming a CCV student is easy, so is transferring CCV credits, which made them the logical choice of partner in a continuation initiative. And number three, um, number three of three, we ensured extra supports for CCV and for students, like um, some nominal funding to help administer and evaluate the initiative and incentives for students to connect with academic advisors, career consultants, peer advisory groups. So all in the 2020 grad gift cost $655,000. Um, I think it's worth noting that Historically, the McClure Foundation uh, is not a scholarship funder, but we have come to believe that scholarships are a particularly useful tool during the pandemic for inspiring public hope in the value and accessibility of college yeah. and career training. Now, we, we dipped into, uh, into our invested assets, almost double what we budgeted in 2020 uh, in order to make it happened and what we learned has helped us clarify our vision of what's possible in Vermont, which is guaranteed affordable college and career training options that are well messaged, easily understood and accessed that lead to good jobs and create more equity and resilience in communities. And while scholarships are a tool that philanthropy has long leaned on, I'm not sure that we see scholarships alone as a systemic long-term approach for affordability, unless they're paired with significant direct investments, including tuition reductions in the places where students who are least likely to continue are most likely to go. Um, I thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony and I welcome any questions, um, any questions that you have. Great, well, first of all, again, um, Thank you. It what it's incredible uh, and clearly had uh, incredible results. Um, and you know we are we are looking also now to see if there are ways that we can continue this kind of work. Um, so in that way, also I think it has us thinking. Of course, that it would be um, one of the things that you said at the end there was that you feel scholarship isn't usually part of the McClure Foundation work. Uh, but in this particular case, given the pandemic, you decided to move in this direction. Um, and it sounded like this kind of investment was, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I, in a way I'd love to be wrong, that this was a one-time thing. Uh, and for you to do additional um, scholarship support in any way, you would also be looking for the state to partner to actually lower the tuition in some ways or, or look for perhaps the state to invest in other ways in, in CCV. Am I uh, articulating that correctly? I think so, um, Senator Campion, and I can, um, I can walk through a couple of, of those. Um, yes, I think, as I mentioned, right, we are historically not a scholarship yeah. Um, funder, although we do believe that scholarships are a useful tool during the pandemic because they are a mechanism for inspiring so much hope broadly. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, a the reason that we don't see scholarships alone as a or the systemic approach for college affordability, um, especially from a policy perspective, is that they just don't fundamentally lower tuition rates across the board, right? And so they're limited in their ability to change the public's question of affordability in a state with incredibly high tuition. Um, yeah. Again, so that's that's part of why um, we would love to see systemic investment in the 
institutions and places where the students who are least likely to continue are most likely to go. I think there are ways to make institutional investments that drive down the cost of enrollment for everyone. And yet, um, this is a this is a pan pandemic, and in 2021, um, the conditions of uncertainty um, in families and the labor market in terms of how college and career training are delivered are continuing. And so, yes, I think Vermonters do deserve extra one-time enrollment incentives this year that inspire hope about the value of college and career training. Absent that, national trends, um, it seems to me, pretty clearly indicate we'll see a lot of deferred continuation and stopped out students. I think before I get it over to everyone, uh, I just want to mention the one thing that was incredible to me is for so long I've thought, um, it, you know, that, you know, we, we have, again, this high graduation rate from high school. And then, you know, a lot of students don't continue on to higher ed. And, and I think in some ways one thinks, and there could be some issues with preparedness at the pre-K through 12th grade, there, there might be some issues, but one of the things that you've shown me is that it's likely even more than that, uh, or maybe even not that, it is about the financial expense. It is about um, a family sitting there, even, you know, you're, you're, you're a solid student, you've worked hard, but you look at these costs, you're a first generation college student, and you um, and to start that kickstart that process is really hard. So I think the other thing that this grant this gift has shown us is that you know it so much of it is about accessibility and the lack of accessibility financially. So thank you, Senator Perchlick. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Did you? Yeah, I'm ready. I just had a flag. Oh, oh no problem. Um, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Ms. Weir, uh, for that. Testimony and for the it's, it's a good example of creative philanthropy, but I, I hear what you're saying about long range institutional investments. I run a, a fund for the state and we're, you know, similar looking where we would we try to invest our money in things that, that do market transformation and things like scholarships, I would not say is doing market transformation, but I think it is a, a creative solution for the times. One question that I have that maybe is not really for you, maybe it's for President Judy or something is, you know, what, what has been the impact of the other students that go to CCD of, of, of having, I guess, maybe not so much your scholarship. So maybe it's not an appropriate question. I'm thinking more of the, of all the high schoolers that are going, I uh, mean, I guess new high schoolers that you guys help support is, is a little different, but I don't know if you've had any did any of your data gathering from the gift talked about other other benefits other than the, the students that took the took advantage of it? Does that make sense? In terms of um, Senator Perch, like influence on aspirations for other classes or participation in concurrent enrollment opportunities like dual enrollment in early college? Or are you thinking something outside of those lines? Or even was, was the, did classroom discussions become more dynamic? I mean, yeah, yeah, bigger, bigger classes or just, you know, to help the institution. Yeah, I guess any, anything that you guys looked at or you guys were really focused on the, the impact of the kids that no, we were really focused on the impact of um, this cohort of 600 to 650. Um, but I think what was clear to us is that CCV with its 20 plus year history of online learning, its set class size, the work that it had already done to build out both academic supports, but also non-academic supports like career consulting was just ready to scale. So. Um, I shouldn't have been surprised by the degree of responsiveness of, of CCV. They've been our cornerstone grantee partner for 10 years, um, but we went from idea to launch public announcement with the governor in 10 days. And CCV's responsiveness as an institution and their ability to scale, um, I can't imagine being matched. Senator, did you have a follow-up question, Senator Persley? No, okay, Senator Lyons and then Senator Hooker. Uh, thank you, this is really um, great, great to hear. Uh, and I'm a strong supporter of CCV, so you've just reinforced that support. Uh, the, I do have a question. As you, uh, you say that 70% of the students passed their classes, and that's probably a very 
that's good. Um, when they when you finished uh, talking with students and as they came out of this experiment, I call it an experiment, but this experience maybe, did you do a thorough sort of exit in interview uh, to try to understand what else besides scholarships would A, have attracted them into the academic environment after high school, and then B, what might help them succeed uh, in it while they're at the institution or to continue on. Uh, I mean, obviously, as we all know that CCV has very strong non-academic supports, but perhaps this little cohort might have offered something further. And I don't know um, if you did that type of analysis afterwards. Thank you for the question, Senator Lyons. I think the answers are broadly yes, no, and yes. So yes, we um, uh, built a survey for students about the experience um, and about the influence of this free course on their plans. And we incented um, participation in and completion of that survey. Um, and as a part of that process have identified students willing to participate in things like focus groups to tell us even more about their experience. Um, we did not ask specifically your first question, but we did ask specifically your second, which is essentially um, in what you, you, the student have told us is your plan for next steps, including continuing an education, continuing an education and working, working, taking care of family, et cetera. What help do you need to take that next step? Is it completing FAFSA? Is it help finding a program? Is it help transferring to another institution? Is it help finding a job? Is it help completing a resume? So it's that type of information that is helping inform um, how CCV and philanthropy broadly continues to support this cohort as we um, also take a look at this idea um, as a pandemic era approach for supporting continuation. Senator Hooker. Thank you, Senator Campion, and thank you, Ms. Weir. Uh, this is fabulous. And, you know, I wish we could give all our kids gifts like this every year. But uh, uh, I have a question about the application process to get involved. You said 600 kids, about 10% of our grads. Is that 10% of the grads? Uh, how easy was the application process? Uh, I think that uh, even the idea of filling out an application to go to college is a deterrent for some kids. And I'm just curious to know that. Secondly, uh, the follow-ups as far as the kids are concerned, and you, you mentioned that about, you know, what are your next steps? How easy would it be for this cohort to continue at CCV? What would they have to go through? And thirdly, just a comment that I think the facility of um, online courses for this generation makes a huge difference. It wouldn't to me because I'm afraid of online stuff, but kids are, you know, the digital natives uh, can participate with a lot of uh, cumin and, and uh, expertise that perhaps would, is something that we need to um, consider. Although CCV has been doing it for a long time and, and uh, maybe we just need to expand on that. Thanks for those um, questions, Senator Hooker. In terms of the application process, um, you know, the Community College of Vermont is Vermont's access institution. So the fewest barriers to application and entry of any institution um, in the state. So no application fees, no essays. Um, and that was a big part of, again, why we selected CCD as the single institution to partner with in this continuation, um, in this continuation effort. In terms of um, continuation, um, like all CCV students, this cohort of 600 was supported in um, taking their best next step inclusive of continuing at CCV. Um, from what I understand from CCV, final data on continuation will be available soon once colleges share their enrollment data post ad drop period with the National Student Clearinghouse. Senator Campion, you probably know a lot more about that than I do. Um, we'd be thrilled, I think, to see something um, in the range of 50% continuation this spring semester, given the uncertainties still in play and the fact that this was a first dollar in 
fall semester offer, which means that many of the students who um, took us up on this offer may have had no plan, um, not completed FAFSA, not explored eligibility for a Vermont State Grant, and may have received that support um, over the course of the fall or spring to complete FAFSA for the first time, and maybe thinking about continuation in terms of fall 2021 when those supports go into effect. Um, and um, I fully agree with you on online learning. We were um, hearing from young people that that modality worked well for them. I think in part because CCV managed expectations early and well um, in making the call to go almost completely um, online, uh, online early. And of course their track record um, in that space is, is a long one. Is we're, I'm wondering if, I'm sorry, Senator Hooker, did you have a follow-up? Okay, uh, can you say something about uh, where, how was it advertised and marketed? Was that left with CCV? I was just curious how Orleans County uh, ended up using it a lot. So how, was that something that in the end, it just uh, was, you know, the responsibility of CCV? You know, it was, it ended up being such a hopeful announcement yeah. at such an uncertain time that honestly the news spread like wildfire. That's I think in you. hindsight, we, um, and this, this idea uh, wasn't conceptualized until maybe June 2nd, and we went public on June 12th, I think. Um, and that was the day that most students graduated from high school. So yeah. um, initially I was concerned that we lost an opportunity to hold hands with our K-12 partners and especially school counselors at the high school level and getting the word out since most students had already graduated by the time um, this was public. And yet in that um, student survey that I mentioned, 50% of surveyed students said they heard about the gift through their high school. So our K-12 partners uh -huh. in the state went above and beyond in letting graduated students know about this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it was really between June 12th and end of August that those 600 enrolled. That's great. Other questions, comments? It, it's it's incredible. I, I hope, thank you. I. I uh, I hope you'll share the success nationally because I know we are not an anomaly here. Uh, and I know the federal government also is trying to give greater access, uh, particularly as it relates to community colleges. So um, I'm sure that uh, the Biden administration and other states would um, be really interested in learning about um, how successful this, this gift was. Thank you, um, Senator. I hope so too. I caught yesterday that Dr. Biden's um, uh, framed community colleges as our most powerful engine of prosperity. Um, I think in the context of COVID recovery, but I think it holds true. Um, I think it holds true generally, tr generally too. And as we think about um, the likely direction of federal funding, um, in the coming years and the likelihood that that funding will hinge on states, existing state support for um, affordable community college or other um, public college tuition. I think it's Ms. Weir, uh, you froze. I'll tell you. Even last night on the national news I was watching, you know, it's, no one is immune from it. Uh, so let's just give her a moment. If our conversation ever gets really tense or, con uh, or controversial, I'm going to pretend to freeze and just lock my. Webcam. I, think, I, I, I was going to say, I think we found a little place that needs some uh, added uh, internet service. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, I think we may have lost her. Oh, here we She's in the waiting room. Here we are. Okay. <clears throat> There, well, she is. there you are. I'm so sorry about that. That was oh, the end of my sentence. It, it, no problem at all. No, we were just saying no one is immune from those moments of uh, freezing. So uh, no problem. Uh, any other, anything else from you, Ms. Weir, or from anyone from the committee? 
we hope to have you back uh, as we make our way through, uh, you know, trying to uh, build on the incredible work that you all did and just congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. All right, have a good afternoon. You too, take care. Thanks. Great. So uh, committee, we are shifting gears uh, two directions uh, for the rest of the afternoon. We are returning to uh, S16. Uh, you may recall, we made a few edits to it. Uh, Mr. Demaray is here uh, to take us through those edits. Um, and then we are going to hear from Secretary French who will uh, respond to uh, the most recent draft. I'm still, and I'm looking to Senator Lyons. Uh, uh, Senator Lyons, have you been given the green light from Senator Ballant to take bill? We're gonna need to get some committee votes going and I'll, I'll loop to Senator Ballant. I'm just wondering if you have any insight um, into whether or not non-COVID bills can now make their way to the floor? You know, I can't answer that. The, okay. the bill, the, the one bill that we sent, we voted on today has- um, Money? No, no oh. money, but it does relate to um, stress and mental health issues. Yeah. Uh, and actually before, during and after COVID. So, but it's, um, it's, uh, Senator Terenzini will be justifying its existence when he presents it. Senator Terenzini, I am going to do you a big favor right now. Uh, in case, uh, you know, I think this has ended, but you, I'm sure, uh, oh, no, it, oh, okay. Oh, of course, it, I tried to warn him about that. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> yes, so, you know, this, this uh, hazing, if you will, or not hazing, that's, you know, but these people, you know, people get up, I would just, uh, uh, be as prepared as possible. Um, but the good news is, yeah. I think I think we've sort of evolved out of it. Actually, I think it's I think it's good for us to evolve out of it. Um, and uh, but I'm sure you'll get one or two uh, hopefully humorous questions. Well, I appreciate that, Senator Campion. Uh, Senator Lyons did warn me of that uh, no less than two hours ago. But I uh, I. I did consider my options, and one is just to uh, hit the leave the red leave button on my screen, so I could just leave the meeting. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Freeze. <laughs> that's right. So. Well, I am not. You know, there are people. Uh, in fact, everybody on this screen, save for me, is 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 gifted when they get up and do these floor reports. I never have been, so uh, I'm not the one to look to for coaching, but. I'll be there to defend you if, if you need any. I very much appreciate it. So yeah, it's a tough, yeah. tough crowd. It can be a tough crowd. Uh, all right. So can I, I, yeah, I will yeah, say that if, if you need a, a question to ask, I'm yes. happy to give you one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Right, right. And you, can, you can defer questions to the chair of your committee. Yeah, that's, yeah, true. Yeah. that's true. That's true. Yeah. Although, but if it's coming from your chair, then I don't know. <laughs> right, exactly. No, he will probably say something like, well, you should know the answer to that. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> I have a feeling it's going to be great. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, the question to Senator Lyons, I will loop to Senator Ballant and just check in. It looks like I think we can, we can move this and vote on it probably later this week. Um, but uh, I'll confirm with her. So, Mr. Demaray, uh, thanks for being with us. And uh, please take us through the changes. Uh, and you are muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, do you want this on the screen or are you seeing this I on your screen? Unless other senators uh, want to see it on the screen, I'm fine with it not being on the screen. It's easier for me to see questions. Everyone has it? Okay, so yeah. I think we're okay without it. Thank you. Okay, so for the record, uh, Jim Damore going through draft 2.1 of your amendment to S16, which is uh, the creation of the School Discipline Advisory Council. Uh, virtually changes from the draft you reviewed last week. Just picking up a few comments. Um, so the first change is on page four. Um, on lines 15 and 16. So it's just been clear that the membership of the task force 
has to be a balanced representation of the following. Jim, just so you know, it's technology. Uh, you're you're in and out a little bit, and it's uh, technology related. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, that 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 sounds good. Let me take take off that camera. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. 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 So that's the first change, and then on the uh, page five. Uh, and membership diversity, um, uh, again, uh, we made reference to balanced representation of public and approved independent schools, including therapeutic schools. And then the next change is on page seven, uh, top of the page. Uh, so one of the duties now, uh, number seven, is to review how other states address exclusionary discipline. And then the report requirements have changed a bit. Uh, we got more specific saying that the report has to address each of the um, task force duties under section D. Uh, and then it says the agency of education shall share the report and any related insights and best practices with Vermont educators, school management, school med administrators, policymakers, agencies, and education and advocacy organizations and she'll post the report on its website. And the uh, incorrect references to subsections has been fixed. Um, and those are the only changes. One question I have, it's really for com the committee uh, on page four, we have um, high school students. Do we want to just keep that? I mean, I'm assuming high school students. Is there any reason to just keep it students? Or is it just that we've, as I'm actually asking, it seems like it really would be high school students that we want. It's not as though somebody's going to have, um, you know, I think a younger student. So, yeah, Senator Perchlik. Um, yeah, it no, I, says it, doesn't it? It it says high school students. I was thinking uh, it should just say students, but then oh. as I was asking the question, right. I thought, well, it probably does make sense for it to be high school students. Senator Perslick, uh, I agree. So I had another question separate from that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, on page five, where the change was balanced representation of public and independent schools, and including therapeutic schools, I just wondered if. If we want balanced representation, does that mean there has to be equal number of independent schools in public schools, or is it balanced in their proportional numbers? Because it seems like you, that could be read that you have to have an equal number of public and approved independents. And I'm all supportive of approved independents being involved, but I don't know if I want or if it's a good idea to have you know one half of each. I think it's a very good point. So it's not clear in the draft. So you're your dual interpretations could be, it's not clear. So we can clarify that point. What if we were to just get rid of balanced? How would you feel about that? Because then representation of public and approved independent schools, including therapeutic schools. I think Senator Perchlick makes a good point. I, I wouldn't want it 50-50. Uh, I wouldn't you know, want it. I, I, uh, how, does, how does that feel, getting rid of balanced? OK. And then it, OK. Good, why don't you get rid of that? Okay. Any other immediate concerns, seeing that uh, we'll continue our work on this and as is tradition, uh, a new Senator will present it. So it's likely Senator Chittenden's and Senator Terenzini is already covered in health and welfare. We just, uh, <laughs> uh, anything, anything else at this point before we hear from Secretary French? Okay, uh, Jim, if you don't mind staying on the line. Right, of course. Okay, terrific, thank you. Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon, how are how you, are sir? You? Good to see you. Likewise, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. Uh, you've been part of this conversation already. Uh, as you know, we've, we've made some changes uh, and um, would love to have you you weigh in and give us uh, uh, 
uh, your advice, comments, um, you name it. Well, for the record, Dan Fresh, Secretary of Education. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the work that's gone into this. Um, I think it's in really good shape. I did. There's just really one issue that stood out to me, um, which I, you know, is a point I raised previously, and it's uh, it has it emerges two places in the bill. Uh, the first time on page six in uh, what's number five. Yes. So the paragraph, um, analyze current data collection definitions practice used in Vermont for misconduct and for disciplinary actions that result in students exclusion and develop standard definitions and practices. So um, point I, I made previously, I think this is problematic uh, for Vermont to develop its own definitions. Um, you know, part of certainly part of the rationale of the findings that are bringing this policy concern forward is this idea that we have national data and perhaps we don't have sufficient Vermont data. If we're going to collect data from districts, and I, I think this is a worthy area to collect data, we need to ensure that it conforms with national data standards so that we can draw those valid comparisons to Vermont trends in other states. But just on a practical side, it becomes problematic for us uh, to implement if we're creating our own data defi definitions in Vermont when our data model that we've been trying to promulgate is in alignment with the uh, Common Education Data Store, the SEDS standard, the National Data Definition sort of dictionary, which I, in my view is, is broad and, and comprehensive. And I would just suggest that we not invent our own data definitions, but seek to use ones that are already available in the large lexicon of data definitions on the national level. Is there any... Um... Anything problematic about that? In other words, uh, just thinking aloud, if is there a, is there a, a point, Mr. Secretary, where we would not agree with the definition in some way, uh, or it would just, you know, it it would really kind of pigeonhole us or put us back to kind of where we, you know, we're trying to evolve out of. Yeah, I think if, firstly, it becomes, you know, as I mentioned, I think it becomes problematic to draw a national comparison. So from a policy perspective, we're interested in, well, and how does, what is Vermont's context relative to nas the national or the other context from other states, which once again, as I read, is part of the rationale for promoting this is that we've, we've observed some national trends that are disturbing. Yeah. And we want to understand to what extent those trends exist in Vermont, and therefore we want to collect some data to do that. To do that apples to apples comparison, we should be using the same data terms. Okay. And then secondly, and then this is where I sort of put on my secretary hat from a defending the capacity of the agency, it becomes really problematic for us to interject some new data definitions that are not in that broader sort of dictionary, if you will, of data elements. Um, it just, it, it becomes a multiplier of complexity as we seek to automate data collections from school districts um, you know, we're, we're going to be constantly saying, oh, this is a Vermont subset that doesn't necessarily exist in a larger model, as opposed to saying, here's the larger model, and then we can pick the elements from that that we want to see included in a specific Vermont collection. That makes it a lot easier for us to, uh, to manage over time. Senator Persley. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a point well taken, but I, and I wonder if just if we just, instead of using the word develop, we said adopt. We do have as necessary in there, so it's like you could say it's not necessary to develop, but instead just saying and adopt standard definitions and practices, does that? Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's um, it does emerge two places in the bill, and I was going to point out it also is in um, the uh, on page eight. Um, <clears throat> so it does get to this in page eight at the bottom on line 13. Secretary of the State Board shall incorporate the task force standard definitions. Um, so in, in, to the Senator's point, uh, the task force adopted definitions or recommended definitions. Um, you know, and I would almost suggest something like the data elements as opposed to definitions. So <clears throat> the idea is not that the task force is going to define or create new standards of data, but they might select some from the dictionary that we're not collecting data on. Um, I think that would be more appropriate. Um, or just data, you know, Sean Corbett Task Force recommended data, you know, and then we could we could pull from the, the elements to do that. But it's problematic, I think, to, to engage in defining new data elements. 
How does that sound, Senator Perslick? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. And Jim, do you have enough information there to, to make that edit? Uh, I think I do, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Would we keep? Go ahead. Would we keep the word practices or Secretary French, are you also worried about practices? No, I think practices is a term of art. I mean, that's, that could include a wide range of activities. I'm not, that doesn't really have implications um, either on a comparative state by state basis, because, you know, for example, uh, restorative practices is, is, is not necessarily so narrowly defined from state to state that it would, would uh, cause a problem with drawing that comparison. And similarly, there's no standard when we get into the practical aspect of collecting data, it's not, it's not going to be limiting or uh, impact our, our capacity. Okay. okay. Anything else in sector? No, I think, I think that was really the one, the one piece that stood out for me. I did, um, I have read through the draft. Um, I think, you know, to your conversation about clarity, uh, just getting tighter on what you'd like me to do or the secretary to do relative to uh, balanced representation would be good to get some clarity on. But, um, you know, the only the piece that stood out for me was that data definition part. Um, but I think that's really the only suggestion I had. Okay. Anything else, committee? I think we're going to loop back to make sure... Uh, touch base with our, our co-sponsors uh, of this and make sure they're comfortable and um, talk to a few caucus members and pro tem and, and uh, perhaps have another conversation and then hopefully uh, move it forward. Mr. Secretary, while we, while we have you here, I just wanted to give you a, a, a heads up. And we, we have been, and I know you have been uh, looking at, you know, what we might be doing for students this summer uh, uh, around um, everything from mental health issues or uh, to just getting students out, sort of bringing them back into the academic fold, some perhaps um, addressing some academic deficits. And we're hoping if possible, uh, we might have you back in Tuesday to talk with us a little bit about the agency's plan or thoughts and what we have, I will email you as well, um, to save you the time of watching uh, yesterday's testimony. Uh, just some of the, the things that we pulled out of having heard from, you know, for lack of a better expression, you know, the usual suspects, NEA. And, and I know this group has also been in conversation with you, but I didn't want to um, uh, sort of catch you off guard in any way that, you know, we've been having these kinds of conversations as I, I think you're, you're aware of. Yeah, no, I mean, next week would be great. I think it's perfect timing from us. We've been, we have been working a lot with stakeholders to conceptualize this. I think I might've mentioned previously, it's been somewhat challenging um, at the national level to do this work because there's not many states ready for the conversation. Many yeah. states are still very much in, in thinking about, I would say some are even contemplating reopening their schools. You'll hear that a lot in the national media lately. Um, but um, we've been sort of pushing the conversation along. Uh, there's a number of states that have now joined in, maybe four or five states, but we're, with our conditions in the state, I think we're ready to have that conversation. Not sure, you know, um, what the timelines would be, but the conceptualization of it is important. And part of the strategy is to do that planning now, yeah. specifically so we could leverage summer and, um, you know, not necessarily just wait till the fall to begin the conversation to really take advantage of the opportunity to have that conversation now. So we've, we've, we've been pulling together the threads of the conversation and have reached a sort of, I think, a coherence uh, to it that we'd love to share with you next week. That'd be great. And leveraging the summer is, is a great way to put it. It's terrific. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Senator Campion, you can tell me it's not the right time to talk about it, but since we're in S16, I, sure. I wanted to go back to a comment I made the other day, if you'd allow, and Senator Perchlick, I believe, responded to my question, but maybe it's how I'm reading it or interpreter, interpreting it or thinking about the creation of this task force, but I'm still hung up on the part that says that um, in conjunction with the agency of education, make recommendations to end suspensions and expulsions for all but the most serious student behaviors. I sort of feel like, I don't know how to word it. We're, we're telling, if we're telling the committee 
what to how to recommend it and what to how to think already then why have the committee and b why don't if if there's folks on the committee that feel that we should get rid of ex, um expulsions and deten or uh, suspensions then why don't we just enact that rather than including it in a task study where we're telling them how to think and how to proceed does that make sense so uh Please correct me if I'm, I'm getting this wrong, but you're asking, you know, does it make sense just to pass a law that says, hey, you know, we've got enough research here, let's move away from this, rather than create a task force that, um, you know, might, may or may not get to, to basically where we want to be on these issues. I'm well, sure. it's sort of, it's sort of like if I was asked to sit on the task force and, yeah. you know, you want um, my opinion because I'm bringing an expertise to the committee. And then I look at, oh, well, the, the Senate Ed Committee already decided for me that I need to be in support of uh, dissolving suspensions. I, I sort of don't think as a, as a member of that committee that's going to be formed, you have the freedom of thought at that point. I see what you're saying. So that's what I keep getting hung up on. It's on page four and page five. It's both referred to. And, and so, and that, and maybe, maybe it, uh, I missed it the first time, but somehow I feel like that's that sort of made its way into this bill as it evolved. I don't remember it being in the original draft that we looked at. So uh, it's a it's a great question. Um, I can take a look at the underlying bill, unless Jim, you may already be ahead of me uh, looking to see if it was in the underlying bill. Uh, and Senator Perch, like I see your hand is up. It was not in the underlying bill. I do not think it was in the Senator Sears' bill, but it was in the language that Secretary French provided. Right, us. Before, yeah. I'd be interested to hear what the Secretary fe feels. Does he feel like it's settled that expulsions and suspensions out of school are, you know, or, you know, is that settled in, you know, the educational community that it's not helpful and that we need to move to how, how to implement it? Or does he think more discussion is needed on that question? Yeah, I, I, if I could, um, I, I, we didn't introduce the, the sort of the, um, I would say the findings that are in this final version that they're not unfamiliar to me. Uh, so I think, you know, to try to draw the connection to the other senator's comment, um, there is some, some national consensus that um, exclusionary, dis, dis, uh, exclusionary discipline processes uh, proportionally dis, uh, affect uh, students of minority populations and so forth. So it's, there's pretty strong data on that as part of a national trend. And um, so therefore, uh, we should endeavor to examine to what extent that's happening in Vermont and endeavor also to see what we could do to minimize the use of such practices just based on what we already know of the national patterns. So that's that's sort of the context, I think, for, for saying that. So in my from my perspective, I think it's important to have um, broader engagement and conversation about uh, these topics and to what extent those patterns exist in Vermont and also uh, from a practical standpoint, then examine to what extent uh, the more exclusionary practices could be limited. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the trend that we should examine. It, it comes from a national approach. It needs to be informed by Vermont data and uh, Vermont uh, perspective based on the practical uh, aspects of our diverse uh, education delivery system. So I think that's that's how I would draw the sort of thread the needle between the previous senator's comment and the, the rationale for the bill. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, Commissioner French. I, I guess uh, I want to make it clear, if, if there's disproportionate suspensions or biases here, it, it absolutely needs to stop. It's, it can't be accepted. But I guess it's, a, it's another question for me is, then why don't we just come forward with something very simple and say, those in favor of ending suspension, let's just make it a, another bill. I mean, it just seems like this is a study that handles a lot of things. And now we're telling a committee how to think um, in one way uh, with the intentions of ending suspensions and expulsions. I'm, I'm probably splitting hairs here. I won't take any more of the committee's time, but it, it just seems like it, to me, it's a sort of a sticking point. So I'll move on though. Thank you, Senator. No, I, 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 I'm glad you're raising it. Um, I think, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like in a way, <clears throat> The goal of the commission, as sometimes we do with other commissions, we do give some general guide, guidance uh, and direction uh, 
that, you know, we've looked at research, we've analyzed a number of things, and now we want to move in a particular direction. I, I'm just thinking of, you know, things we've done in natural resources, climate, uh, education, health and welfare. You know, here's the research. This is now the direction we're hoping to move in. That being said, I do feel like there's a piece of this that still recognizes that, you know, there are uh, certain behaviors, certain experiences uh, that a teacher might witness, be a part of, uh, that a student might exhibit that, that, you know, a suspension or expulsion might be necessary. And how do we, how do we work with that student going forward? So um, that's a little bit where I'm at. I'm not sure if that's helpful, Senator Terenzini. Well, I, pre I appreciate the comments. I, 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 and maybe it's just the way I'm interpreting it, but I've served on panels and boards before, mm -hmm. and I've just never been told sort of this is how I need to think as a board member or commi committee member of this. And I just feel like we're, you know, you're going to pick 15 or 20 people to sit on here and um, hopefully you, hopefully you think like us and you, you know, believe that we should get rid of suspensions for X amount of reasons. So anyways, like I said, I, I appreciate the time of the committee and I know that we have. Um, Senator Hooker, did you want to add something to this? Uh, no, actually, I wanted to go back to summer and talk okay. about what, you know, what we may be doing. And this morning, uh, Secretary French, the chair and I met with uh, the money committee people and, and the house ed people and talked about some of the things that would need to be done um, to reach out to what yesterday people referred to as the ghost students who haven't shown up. And my question was related to attendance and the um, how attendance has been kept during the pandemic. And do you have data um, that shows, you know, where the where the kids are going to school and where they're not? And would that be easily accessible so that that could inform the um, work that needs to be done for summer programs? Yeah, we don't, uh, if you were to ask me to produce a report for your use, I would not be able to do that very easily at this point. We do collect uh, essentially at the state level attendance data on an annual basis. We have implemented a monthly data collection, uh, which I'd be happy to share the results with you on, on a general level. Once a month, we ask school districts to indicate the number of their students that are either an in-person hybrid or remote. But on the other hand, the school districts have their, their granular data necessary for the planning for their specific circumstances, so they have a good sense of, of the need. Um, and just you know, to foreshadow a bit uh, for next week if we come in and testify on this, because I would also like to include our, our deputy secretary who's been leading uh, a lot of this up, uh, Heather Boucher. The, um, it's important that I think what in broad sense, what we're thinking to do is to, to point districts towards sort of a triage disposition in the spring to, to sort of listen and find out what, what are the issues in their districts. And that's, we, we have in a very directive way how to, an idea of how to do that. And then secondly, to create plans and then to move to implementation uh, this spring, uh, which would include the use of summer programming. Um, as opposed again to waiting to the fall. But we also know there's, you know, there's going to be a need uh, to transition to the summer. And part of that in schools is a celebratory disposition. So the people are gonna be interested in saying, oh, we've gotten through the winter, you know, and let's land, end the school year on a positive note. Um, we also know that our systems have been operating nonstop, especially issues like food service programs have been oper operating nonstop since last March. So there's gonna be need to be some downtime in the summer as well. But the point I'd make is that we have an opportunity to do the planning, which would lead to some prioritization, and then districts uh, using their data to develop specific district level plans of how to intervene. Uh, because we're not gonna find, I'm pretty sure that all students have been affected the same in all, all districts. So districts are gonna have to come up with specific approaches. There are gonna be some general trends uh, that are gonna require some state uh, response and, and truancy in our attendance is one of them. And specifically, we've already had, you'll see in our planning, it's one of the domains. We're going to have to come up with a more, um, uh, I'll say broad approach to that issue. We, we qualified as engagement issues with students. You use the term ghost students, but our current truancy uh, levers, if you will, are, are gonna be woefully inadequate to address that issue. And really you can see truancy in a pandemic as sort of being tip of the iceberg of a lot of other issues that are going on with students and their families. 
So we're going to we're going to have to organize uh, state government services as well between DCF Mental Health and the Agency of Education. Um, and we're going to I think that'll be a common theme in every region, but we're going to have to um, figure that out. We currently truancy is organized on a regional basis through the state's attorneys in each region, but we're going to have different patterns in each region. So at any rate, that's sort of the broad brush what we're looking at. I think I, I would I think summer is important, but it's sort of um, a conclusion from an analysis that needs to occur first and we'll get districts there, but we want them to go into that planning well informed about what their priorities are. The other key thing is that this spring sometime around in April is when they start formulating their grant strategies for the consolidated federal program grants. These are like the title grants, title one, title two, which are traditionally the major funding systems that support summer school. So um, they're going to have to come up with their plans for those grant funds and additional to their ESSER grant funds and so forth that have been provided as a result of the COVID emergency. So it's important that districts engage in some planning process and set priorities that can inform and focus, help to focus their resources and leverage summer uh, to its maximum potential. Thank you. Great. And we'll continue this conversation next week. Thank you.